Hi, I'm Alistair Allen with Make here at MakerCon, talking to Evan Upton, the founder of Raspberry Pi. Morning. Good to be here. Excellent. So you just given your talk and you talked about how the Raspberry Pi started out and how it was a response to the, the drop in applications to study CS at Cambridge. Yeah, so, so this was really weird for us about, about 10 years ago. We found ourselves sitting in Cambridge, which thinks of itself, I think, with good reason as being kind of a premier institution for doing computer science and engineering in the UK, um, and looking around and struggling to find enough 17 and 18 year olds who wanted to come to our university to study computer science. Yeah. So um, the, the applications have recovered uh, uh, since then? Yeah, and so applications have actually now recovered uh, from, they fell from about 500 in the, the, the height of the dot-com boom to maybe 200 in 2008. They've now rebounded to six or 700. Um, as I, I said in my talk, I really want to claim all the credit for that. I think what's actually happened is a broad, kind of a broad coalition of organizations who, who are interested in STEM education, and also the broader kind of maker movement, this broader trend towards young people thinking that it's a cool thing to do to try and go out and build stuff, has really given us back that supply of talented teenagers that we have, that we, we last saw in the 1980s. That's really awesome. And you said that the success of the Raspberry Pi has let you do things that you wouldn't otherwise have been able to do. Do you want to talk about that briefly? Yeah, r the idea with Raspberry Pi, yeah, we were just trying to reboot, we were trying to solve a very local little problem, right? We, we thought if we get a thousand Raspberry Pis into the hands of the right thousand kids, then we'd be, we'd be set. We'd have our extra few hundred applicants a year. Um, what the success of Raspberry Pi and the, the fact we've been able to make, make and sell Raspberry Pi profitably has done is it's given us access to a source of revenue that we've then been able to reinvest because we're a charity. None of that money comes out in Ferraris for me. Um, and uh, all of <laughs> Or Teslas, I don't know. Um, but um, uh, that's given us the source of revenue. We've been able to invest in things like educational resources. So we're now quite a large, as an organization, a large producer of free um, educational resources in the maker area. Um, we've also been able to invest in things like teacher training and even things like uh, you know, government relations. You know, we you know, have enough money that we have time to go and talk to government and really the UK government and other governments and really try and explain to them why, why we had a problem, why we have a problem, and what they should be doing to try and fix it. Okay. And one of the things you talked about quite extensively uh, was the onshoring of production, the, the, the pulling the Raspberry Pi out of China and making it in South Wales. I, I thought that was a really interesting point. So maybe you want to talk about that? Yeah, we, um, like everybody else, when we started make, trying to make a cheap thing, we thought, let's go make it in Shenzhen. Great realization for us is we can make it more cheaply. We build Raspberry Pi in the UK, and we don't build it in the UK because we're nice guys. We build in the UK because we're cheapskates. Um, it is a cheaper place to build uh, for, for a low-touch product like Raspberry Pi. Uh, and I think a lot of other products in that kind of maker, kind of maker pro kind of area qualify as low touch. They're often bare PCB assemblies without a case, not not a, not a lot of you know. There isn't ten minutes of assembling tiny fiddly screws to put a Raspberry Pi together. Um, I think pretty much every product in that space, if you're prepared to do the work. Uh, if you're prepared to do the optimization work on the design to make it suitable for manufacture, if you just if you just take a, a device that's been designed to be built in an area with low labor costs, and you bring that device, that product, and that production process, and you bring those to the West, you bring those to a high labor cost economy, you are going to lose money. But it's almost always possible to take your product, redesign it, and redesign the production process, uh, generally for more automation, uh, so that you can make it not just at the same price in the West now, but more cheaply. That's really interesting. So was there anything in particular in Raspberry Pi that you had to re-engineer when you moved it uh, back on shore into the UK? Um, there, was a lot of, um, there was a lot of work in terms of, uh, a lot of it I would say is test engineering. Um, so the majority of the touch in Raspberry Pi and the traditional Raspberry Pi production process was around uh, tests. So take a Raspberry Pi off the end of the line, you know, break it out of its panel, connect stuff up to it, uh, manually run a test program on it, check the output on the screen, you know, tick a box and put it, and uh, tick a box and pack it. Now what's happened? What you've seen happen over the last two and a half years that we've bu been building Raspberry Pi in the UK is steadily more and more and more um, automation. Generally, what we've done is we've taken the savings of that automation and we've invested them back in the product. So what you saw us do was you saw us go from two five six Six meg to five twelve meg of memory. You saw us go from two USB ports to four USB ports, and then recently, obviously, you've seen Raspberry Pi two. Uh, and so, all of those are really a result of us going and um, going and while, while maintaining about the same production cost, be able to pack more and more and more stuff into the bill of materials. Okay, that's really awesome. Um, so the Raspberry Pi has really become quite ubiquitous. It's one of the, the mainstays of the maker movement, and of course, that wasn't the original intention, obviously, but. It's pretty much everywhere, including the, the International Space Station now. You're about to send one to space. 
Yeah, we are we are most of the way through. So um, uh, um, Dave Honus from the uh, the foundation and Jonathan Bell from Raspberry Pi Training from the engineering organisation have have spent the last six months slogging through the process of getting Raspberry Pi qualified to fly in the International Space Station. Obviously, the ISS is the single most expensive thing mankind has ever built. They are understandably nervous about letting guys like us stick a thing in it in case it makes a hole in it or you know or worse. Um, and so there's there's a there's a flight approvals process. We are now almost all the way through the flight approvals process and we've over the last couple of months been running a competition for school children in the UK to suggest either ideas for experiments that they want um, uh, Tim Peake, UK user astronaut Tim yep. Peake, uh, to run with the Raspberry Pi or in the case of secondary school students actually writing the code that's going to run on the Pi in space. That's absolutely awesome. It's amazing. I saw the uh, the case design was released today on the blog. Oh, it's fantastic! Yeah, yeah there's some kind of amazing kind of steampunk thing. You know, it's got these wonderful. Uh, it's got um, uh, the, um, the 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 sense hat, which is the the you know the the the, the, the sensor package that um, kids have access to. You know, they write their programs against. It has a little joystick on it, but obviously you can't get that little joystick out uh, somewhere where the astronaut can touch it. So what we have instead is the world's most steampunk D-pad, which consists of these four giant clicky buttons that you know, click 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 click, and then two are uh, A, B, and D-pad. Um, so, so yeah, uh, we want to make it so if you put the Konami code in, maybe you know, then you get you know, it'll do something interesting, something hopefully not too dangerous. <laughs> That's absolutely awesome. Thanks for talking to us. No, thanks very much.